Hey guys, Wes here. In this video series, we're gonna look at refactoring a .NET Core MVC web application from being something that's really rather procedural and rigid and tightly coupled and difficult to test into something that's much more object oriented, um, that has some functional aspects to it and that really allow us to um, change the code more easily, write unit tests for it, and really focus on things like extensibility and testability overall. So this is a little bit of a different series, but I thought it would be a, a great way to introduce some slightly more advanced concepts in .NET and in programming in general. Um, and it was a lot of fun to make, so I hope that this series can be a good resource for you, um, especially if you're interested in some more really practical, hands-on .NET uh, programming that you would certainly come across as part of a uh, as part of a job as a developer in your career. I'll post a link to the GitHub repo in the description below and as part of that repo I'll have a few different branches set up. One branch with the start of this project as sort of the messy procedural style code and then on main branch we'll have the fully refactored version um, complete with tests. Another thing that we're going to look at in this series is static code analysis using SonarCube and other tools like CodeCov so you can kind of have some objective measure of quality as you work through the code and we'll actually integrate that into a CI, a continuous integration loop using GitHub Actions. So it was a lot of fun building this and if you have any questions at all be sure to let me know in the comments below and if you get anything out of this series I'd really appreciate it if you liked and subscribed to the channel. As always thanks for watching and I'll see you around. Okay, so here we are with the application that we'll be working on refactoring in this series. We can see that we have a really simple order form here. This is an ASP.NET Core MVC project. And we just have a couple of views to look at uh, this order form page. We can see we have a drop down with some different districts. And if we select a district here, we can also put in an order amount. And then if we just submit the order, what's happening in the background is some really basic uh, processing to create this attached flyer object and to send us over to the order complete page. Um, so depending on the district that we select and a few other factors, we'll get a different attached flyer. So we can see if we select another district and put in some other amount here. In this case, we'll get a slightly different uh, flyer. In this case, we have a, an image attached. And in the background, we're making an HTTP request out to a web API to get an image URL that we can embed here in our order complete view. So some really basic behavior. Um, the focus of this series is really going to be on how we can apply some principles of object-oriented programming and clean code in general to uh, see if we can make this application more extensible um, and easier to change and in general uh, much cleaner so that when we have to do things like add new features or find bugs, um, that's going to be uh, a much better environment for us to do that once the code has been fully refactored and, and cleaned up. So let's go ahead and dive into the code and take a look. So what we have actually is a single web project. Uh, commonly, if you're developing uh, a web application uh, in .NET, you'll have a number of different class libraries to separate out the, the different layers and responsibilities of your app. For this example, everything's going to just exist in a single class library that is an ASP.NET Core MVC web project. Um, so we've got like our services directly in here along with our web layer, which includes our controllers and our views and our view models. Um, so first of all, let's just take a quick look at what's happening inside of our controllers. And we'll take a look at this home controller. Uh, we have a, a single action here. Well, we have two actions. We have an error action. But we'll be focused on this uh, index action, which is what we hit when we actually visit our home page. So we can see that we have some logger here. This is getting injected via uh, constructor injection here, so we can see that the controller is just requesting an iLogger interface of type home controller, and then we're using that logger just to say index loaded here. Uh, we have a list of strings for our districts, um, which are just uh, string literals here in this list of strings, and then we have a view model where we're returning a new order form model, which we can take a look at. It's just a very simple POCO or plain old C-sharp object where we have auto properties for three different properties here. A list of uh, select 
list items, which represent our districts, um, a selected district, and then an order amount. And so what's happening is we're constructing this order form view model, and we are essentially assigning the lowercase value of these districts to the, the values, and the text is just the uh, raw string literal for each of them, and then we're returning that view model. So that's just sort of a simple, almost static page. Really the only thing that's uh, not static is the fact that we're passing these districts into this select list item, um, or list of select list items. So if we take a look now what's happening on the view, if we go into the views here and then we go into home and index, uh, again, very simple as we saw from the quick example, but what we have is an order form and here is our drop down list where we're selecting that selected district and then we're binding that to our view models districts and then the default text here is just select district. We're not going to focus too much on the views here. The, this this, this uh, particular series is really going to be focused on the business logic layer. Um, but what's, what we should note here is that we have this text box for order amount, and then we have an input type of submit where we submit our order. And in Razor, the only thing that we should really keep in mind here is that with this using block, uh, we're essentially have, we essentially have an old-fashioned HTML form where we are calling submit order on our order controller and we're making a post request here with this encoding type multiport form data and essentially we're just posting this to a controller action called submit order so we can take a look at that now and this takes us into our only other controller in this demo where we have the submit order action and so we can see we have an async task that is essentially taking that selected district and that order amount from the view and constructing this new order object with a district and a total and it looks like we're newing up an order service in here so we'll want to keep that in mind um, that's that's not ideal and we're passing it in order so essentially we're setting some state on this also not necessarily ideal and we'll talk about why those things aren't ideal momentarily um, but then we're calling process order and we're awaiting that result so this is an asynchronous method on order service and then we're creating this variable completed order where we are actually calling order service dot get order to get it back and then returning that completed order to the view. So already we can see some things in here which I would say aren't really ideal. Um, for one thing in .NET Core we have a built-in dependency injection which makes it really convenient to make isolated components that don't depend on specific implementations of their dependencies. So instead it allows us to uh, implement a pattern called inversion of control and essentially that is just inverting the control of uh, the request for specific implementations of dependencies from where they're called uh, so from this class for instance to a higher level component um, often called an IOC container or a dependency injection container um, and so we'll take a look at how easy it is to actually set that up in .NET Core throughout this process um, but before we get too deep into that and um, I promise it'll be much easier to understand once we implement it uh, if you're not familiar with it. Um, let's take a look at what's happening in this order service. So this is now in our service layer and so we've got this directory order service here and what I'm seeing off the top here is some pretty procedural looking code. Um, one of my developer he heroes, Sandy Metz, uh, often talks about when you first take a look at a class that you are about to refactor here, just just uh, take a moment and do what she calls the squint test, which is where you just kind of squint and you want to take a look at changes in shape and changes in color for the class. So in terms of changes of shape here or the shape of the class, um, a lot of times in messy, messy classes that are difficult to change, you'll see some really deep nesting. Now in this class, we don't necessarily have uh, a huge problem, I would say, with a lot of deep nesting. There are a couple of nested if blocks here, um, and then clearly this entire method is essentially one big if-else statement. Um, but we also have some changes in color, which often identify that we have mixed up uh, different levels of abstraction in our code. Um, so we can see a bunch of string literals here, um, and 
yeah and so we can see our control flow in a different color here um, so we'll see how that particular aspect of the so-called squint test changes as we clean up our code a bit uh, we have this private method as well which says print advert um, notice that this is in a, this is all the responsibility of something that's been called order service so it looks like we have some call out to print advert that's happening in every block here and this is just mocking sending something out to some maybe print printer API or an actual printer even and it's just waiting for three seconds while we print our custom advertisement uh, and then we have a, a sort of a getter here, a public getter, uh, which could also be achieved using an auto property here, but we see a public getter, which is returning the value of the backing field order, uh, which itself is just a private read-only field on the order service. So this is telling us right away, when we see something like this, that the order service is essentially tracking the state of this model this object so we can see that this object doesn't have any behavior it's not a service class um, and it really doesn't do anything except uh, hold state for in this case an order and so it's often a little uh, sign that uh, things may be uh, you may have subtle uh, bugs or business logic that uh, can get a bit hairy when you have something like a service class tracking the state of an order over time and then having some method on it to actually return its value. Um, and if you think about it just at a very high level, this kind of makes sense. If we have a number of different objects in our in our software which are making use of the same order service um, and uh, and they they both also make use of some order object that the order service is tracking they could be storing different values for orders at different times and so sometimes synchronizing that uh, because of the fact that setting the order here is essentially um, is, is essentially a side effect uh, when we mutate it inside of this class that can get really hairy and so often a better pattern here is rather than pass in some object that stores a value to the service to create it and have it track it, we can make it much more functional by having the methods uh, that mutate this value just return the value immediately um, and so that we can more easily sort of share that state among the collaborators of order service. And I realize I'm talking at a really high level here. It's going to, I think it's going to be uh, make much more sense when we kind of dive in. But that is the overview of the various classes we have here. We do have another class. Let's take a look in our services. We've got this Chamber of Commerce API, which we notice is a static class. Uh, and this is getting called from a few different places in our order service. And we can see that it's making a static call to this get for method, which is taking a district and then it's making an HTTP request to some URL that's hard coded essentially in the code here. And then it's, uh, it's setting up this data result and returning that after making an asynchronous request. Okay, so one thing to keep in mind here is that this is a static class, and so that uh, and and so uh, the method that we have on it is not an instance method; it's a static method, meaning that whenever this static method is invoked and wherever it's invoked, we have no way to sort of unplug it from where it's called from. Whereas if we were able to instead pass some object that represents a Chamber of Commerce API as an object to this class or the method, then we'd have a way to actually isolate uh, the real Chamber of Commerce API here from uh, where it's used. Again, this concept of inversion of control will come into play here. Uh, but if you think about it, if we're going to try to test, for instance, process order, uh, and I just want to invoke this method, I have no way of essentially pulling out this Chamber of Commerce API. And so even if I'm just trying to test the business logic of process order, I'm always going to be making a call to this hard-coded URL that's inside of this static method. And so that's problematic, and we have better patterns for handling this so that we can uh, make process order more testable, and we can make the implementation of the class that implements the API uh, more uh, more flexible and interchangeable. So we'll look at that as well. And then we have this uh, deal service, which 
uh, we can see is used as well. And in this case, it's not a static class, but it's actually newed up inside of one of these else if blocks. And we can see some similar things here, like this long list of uh, string literals and uh, just some very basic business logic in here. So all of these classes comprise the business logic of our application. And I think a good place to start here would be back up at the controllers where we can just take this one step at a time and see the types of improvements that we can make.